Okay, we can get started. <laughs> Sorry for the, for the wait for everybody in here. Um, my name is Christine Schmidt and I'm the Deputy Director and Head of Research here at the library. And I'm really delighted to welcome you to today's talk with Dr. Anna Nyberg on her book, The Clothes on Our Backs, How Refugees from Nazism Revitalized the British Fashion Trade. So I wanted to thank you all for joining us um, here in person. I know you've braved um, some not very nice weather. And of course, to everybody online who joined us, um, we have also want to thank everyone for their support. Um, as you know, the library is a charity and with, with your support, we are able to host free hybrid events like this one. So Dr. Nyberg's book tells the story of the contributions of Jewish refugees to the fashion trade in Britain, recounting how their knowledge and expertise was transferred and transformed in exile. Jews had long been active in the clothing trade in Europe, developing new production and retail methods and excelling as designers. However, in the UK, clothes production was mostly conservative and design was not a concept. Dr. Nyberg asks, what happened to these Jews in the clothing industry after the Nazis came to power in 1933, bent on ridding Germany of Jews? Many found asylum in Britain, where soon the refugee owners of Kongol and other firms were employing thousands of British workers at a time of dreadfully high unemployment. And when war broke out, for example, it was Kongol who made the berets for the British army and other forces. British companies started to recognize what the refugees could offer. Jewish refugees brought new technology, new display methods, a different attitude to export, and much more. And it was no wonder then that, they, that by the end of the war, the refugee clothiers were recognized as having made a disproportionate contribution to the economy. And this is the story of Dr. Nyberg's book. So before I introduce her, just a few notes of housekeeping. We aren't expecting um, a fire drill today. So if in the unlikely event that you hear the alarm, there's only one entry and one exit to the building. So please just exit the building and gather across the street. Um, if you do need the toilets, they're accessible via the lift in the, in the back down to the basement. And again, a warm welcome to everyone online. We will have some time um, after Dr. Nyberg's lecture for Q&A. So if you do have a question, just pop it into the chat. Um, you will be kept on mute during the entire program, but we will um, come to um, anyone in the audience also who has a question if you just wait uh, for the microphone so that people online can hear. So without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Dr. Anna Nyberg is a, an honorary lecturer at Imperial College London, where she has taught languages for many years. Her PhD dissertation in exile studies studied the way in which refugees from Nazism transformed art publishing in Britain. She is a committee member of the Research Center for German and Austrian Exile Studies at the University of London, and we're really pleased to have you here today. So welcome, Anna. Thank you very much, Christine. Do please wave your hand if you can't hear me properly. There's nothing more annoying than somebody not being audible. So um, I'd like to start with the uh, prehistory before we get on to the story of the refugees in Europe. That's better, I'm a bit shorter. In fact, I'm going to plunge you right back in the Middle Ages. Uh, you probably know that at that time, uh, Jews were excluded from many occupations. Just one reason being to protect the guilds. Now this included the selling of new clothing and uh, new fabrics, but they were allowed to trade in secondhand goods. Uh, from old clothes to lengths of fabric, even down to rags, which in Yiddish, of course, are called schmata or schmata. And uh, that's where we get the name rag trade as well. Walking mile after mile, peddling wares, these Jewish sellers over the centuries got to know their customers, but also where to source the goods, who would pay what for, for what goods and so on. They acquired much knowledge by the time of their emancipation in the Napoleonic times, they were ready to set up shop, literally, and they started to uh, create small stores um, using their specialist knowledge. All over the former Austro-Hungarian Empire and what would become Germany, they now traded in fabrics and garments, new and old. Adapting was something Jews had always had to do, moving on, moving with the times, trying out new products and techniques, learning new skills, including new languages, 
and more often uh, open to the idea of travel, perhaps, than their non-Jewish colleagues. And these were all traits which they passed on to their family members and their colleagues. By the end of the 19th century, they had moved into the new phenomenon from the small stores into what was the department store. Now, the first of these were in Paris, and they looked apparently a little bit like Renaissance palaces. But in the first two decades of the 20th century, great modernist sleek buildings like this one appeared in cities like Chemnitz in Eastern Germany, sometimes called the German Manchester because of the um, association with the textile trade. This one here is owned by the Schocken family. They were Jews who had started as grain merchants in Odessa, very much like the family, if you've read The Hair with Amber Eyes, they started very humbly as well. It's a similar trajectory. German department stores in this interwar period were fabulous showcases for ready-to-wear fashion, a huge industry called in German Konfektion. In these shops or stores, there were fashion shows, of course, but also fashion teas, fashion films, all sorts of events around Konfektion. And uh, in the 1920s, Berlin was the center, the epicenter of this industry. There is a terrific book on this subject, by the way, if you are interested, by uh, somebody called Uwe Westphal, and he chronicles not just the huge success of the industry, but also its quick and brutal destruction by the Nazis uh, from 1933 on. And uh, he's campaigning to try and get the contemporary German fashion industry to recognize the harm that was done to the people and the businesses, and he has received death threats. Uh, so he's a very brave person. Now, there were, of course, other important centers of fashion uh, in German-speaking Europe, notably Vienna, Budapest, Prague, where Jews made a major contribution to the clothing trade, whether it was in making military clothing, uh, local traditional costumes in Hungary, perhaps, or just plain fashion, or all the other activities associated with it in the sector. Refugees started to leave Germany, of course, in 1933, when the National Socialists came to power. But most came to Britain uh, in 1938, after the annexation, the so-called Anschluss, of Austria into the Third Reich. The nationalist, National Socialists' aim was to rid the Reich of its left-wingers, free thinkers, and others, and also, of course, its Jewish population. Around 90% of the refugees to Britain were Jewish, or at least Jewish according to the Nazis' criteria. And it's thought that in all, there were around 80,000 refugees who got to Britain before the outbreak of the Second World War. Inevitably, some of these were engaged in the textile trade man as manufacturers, designers, retailers, or in display, and so on. Coming to Britain for them meant coming to the place where the Industrial Revolution had started. We had been known for processing cotton and wool for centuries. Our, fa our uh, fabrics were known and admired all over the world. But for some refugees, Britain had rather rested on its laurels, as we will see. Then as now, some in the trade had grown up in textile families. Others learned the trade at one of the prestigious arts and craft schools in Germany or Austria, uh, just as some young people from textile families also did to widen their knowledge and acquire some theory with, along with their practice. Just one example of these schools was the Ryman School in Berlin. It was as state of the art uh, as the more famous Bauhaus, but much more geared to practical training. Here, you could learn from practitioners how to design fabrics, how to design clothes, but also how to photograph them and display them as well. Window display, that was something you could learn at the Reimann Schule, the Reimann School, but it was certainly not a subject in Britain in the interwar period. 
where uh, in Britain, apparently the shop windows were extremely conservative. They were just pile them high goods. If you were very brave, you might have a vase of flowers. But in Berlin, the shop windows were said to be the best art galleries in the city. And you might have a surrealist window display. Just one person who came to Britain through the Ryman School uh, was Natasha Kroll. Now, I should explain that the Ryman School was Jewish owned, was owned by Albert Ryman and his family, and the school was Aryanized, i.e. taken over by non-Jews. He and his family fled to Britain around 1936, and they started up a very small version of the school in Westminster. Now, if you say, well, I've never seen it, that's because it was unfortunately bombed to smithereens by the Luftwaffe, and we also, unfortunately, returned the compliment, the uh, Royal Air Force bombed this building you see here too. But what happened when the Ryman moved to Britain was that they brought with them some of their very important staff and some of their students. Natasha Kroll was just one. She had studied display in Berlin and she came with the Ryman to London and she helped teach as well. And after she finished her studies, she was the very first person to be responsible for window display at Simpsons of Piccadilly. I don't know if you know that store, it's now a Waterstones, but it was a very sleek, wonderful modernist building and it was a shop that sold, sold clothing. And she um, used the, the windows there to display her knowledge of uh, Berlin acquired um, window display. She later had a very good career at the BBC as well in set design. So this example of the Ryman School can be taken to illustrate a general point that in Germany, Konfektion was a serious and very modern career, one which you trained for. And as I said, this, was contrast, this can be contrasted with Britain where you could not literally dis, uh, study things like window display at that time. When the Nazis came to power, Jewish Germans had few choices of where to go and their lives were in danger. A visa system was introduced for Austrian Jews, but this meant that middle-class people could come on domestic visas, i.e. as housekeepers or gardeners, tasks to which many were unsuited. In Britain, meanwhile, in the 1930s, there was terrible unemployment. It was the hungry 30s. The the northeast and northwest of England were particularly hard hit, also areas of Wales. The steel and coal industries had declined. Just one area uh, of England, we take uh, Cumbria, um, a town called Maryport, 1934, unemployment stood at 60%. But there was an amazing initiative, which is not terribly well known, but I think increasing, uh, increasingly known about and studied. It was made by some enlightened local councillors and MPs too, knowing that in Europe, businessmen, Jewish businessmen were being threatened with Aryanization and worse, they created the Trading Estates Project in the so-called special areas, Northeast, Northwest and Wales of Britain. Essentially, they just improved the infrastructure, the roads and the rail. They built empty new factories and then they went over to the continent and literally knocked on the doors of these uh, particular industrialists and invited them to come to Britain. Uh, luring them to the Northeast and Northwest saying, this would be a good place for you to come. So it was a marriage made in heaven. You had unemployment in, the, in Britain and you had these people who needed to find a new home. It was a huge success. Initially, it didn't create a lot of employment for men. A lot of the industries, the new industries were light. Um, they were light chemicals or things like button making, textiles. Um, but at least then the families had uh, a source of income. And some of these industries are still trading today. Uh, there's a statistic in the book, I think it was by 1947, the companies in the trading estates were employing something like, it was about a quarter of a million people. So absolutely phenomenal and really should be more better known about. 
One of these companies founded then and still trading today is Kangol. It was founded by two Polish Jews who'd actually been living in France. So this double refugee status is quite common, uh, a quite common thread. So they fled in the pogroms um, from Poland to France. And then of course, as the National Socialists came to power, they realized they weren't safe there either. They were Jacques Breiregen and his nephew, Josef Meisner. Now, um, I just grabbed my book. I found an interview online with a lady who had joined the company right at the beginning. And um, she joined very early on. So the factory, she said, was owned by a Mr. Sperrigan, that's her version of Spreirigen, who was a French Jew and his nephew, Mr. Meisner, helped him run the firm. We always knew when Mr. Meisner was around because we could smell his aftershave, which was something new and unusual in Cumbria. So we were forewarned of his arrival and seldom got caught out. Continental sophistication in the form of aftershave had arrived in Cumbria. The French lady she referred to was one of two French technicians brought over by Spreiregen and all early employees recall the language barrier of the first years. Of course, language barriers in textile um, factories is quite a common theme, isn't it? With the, the noisy looms and so on, but they obviously taught everybody by showing them. Now, it was not long uh, after the Meisners and so on arrived, of course, that World War II broke out. For Kangol, this worked out well, for they got the order in 1942 from the government to produce headgear for the British Army. Got my props here. Um, so here's an example, I don't know if you can see, a Kangol beret. Um, who can imagine, for example, Monty, Field Marshal Montgomery, without his Kangol beret? It wasn't just infantry uh, who wore the berries, air raid wardens, all sorts of people wore these, um, wore these berries, a huge number of people. A specialist refugee engineer was actually brought out of internment to maximize the firm's capacity. So on the strength of this huge expansion the, uh, com and the commercial success it brought, the firm was ready to continue trading post-war. Now, as I've already mentioned, refugees had particular strengths and a particular attitude. As I said, they were keen to export, learn a new language and so on. By 1952, Kangol berets and other headgear that they made were being sold in 49 countries. Kangol constantly changed with the times, bringing in new designers, using the Beatles to model their berries in the 60s, Eventually, the long story short, production moved to the USA, where there was a lively market. Who can think of Samuel L. Jackson without his berry? But the machines that they used to make the berries are the original ones, now more than 80 years old, that were first used in Cumbria. Those were shipped across the Atlantic. Now, I mentioned internment, and this is worth a brief comment, for it impacted on the refugees, their private and professional lives, in 1940, after the fall of France, Norway, the Netherlands, and uh, other countries, the UK government started to get cold feet about the enemy aliens, as the German-speaking refugees were now called, living in Britain. Were they fifth columnists, i.e. were they secretly helping the Nazis to invade? Thousands were arrested and shipped to the Isle of Man and other places where they were held behind barbed wire. Not only were communications minimal, so that their poor families didn't know where they were for some time, but for those who were running companies laboriously just set up uh, in Britain, it was a bitter blow. Some firms just closed, never to open again. Others were kept afloat by canny wives, although thousands of women were also interned. Others again were saved when the government realized that their usefulness to the war effort and released the internees. Another trading estates 
story, a success story, is Seckers, also still trading today. Founded by two Jewish Hungarians, Miki Seckers and his cousin, West Cumberland Silk Mills was established in 1938 in Whitehaven in Cumbria. They were making silks for the couture market when they came over here, but when war broke out, they quickly changed over to making synthetic silks for, the parach for parachutes, apparently two million yards of it in all over the war. After the war, Seckers again returned to high-end clothing. They sold fabrics uh, to the likes of Dior and Givenchy, and Seckers commissioned artists to design fabric patterns. Again, uh, this was a, a common theme I found with a lot of the textile designers, they were inspired by art. Now, eventually, Seckers, uh, the firm changed over to furnishing fabrics and relocated. You may know that in the 1970s, the textile market in Britain all but collapsed in the face of competition from the Far East, where cheaper fabrics were now produced. Many companies went to the wall then, whether they were refugee or British founded. But as I have said, the refugees were adept at rolling with the punches and changing and updating. I wondered what these sophisticated Jewish businessmen from the great metropolises like Berlin and Vienna and so on, what did they make of places like the Lake District? Yes, their lives had been saved and their livelihoods assured, but where were the opera houses, the theaters? the concert halls. In fact, it seemed that several of the Germans, Austrians and so on, embraced the British countryside, growing to love it, even taking up fishing and other pursuits. But Miki Seckers, seeing that there was no theater for miles around, decided to build his own on his own grounds, the Rose Hill Theater. It's still there today, um, and uh, has had a number of celebrated performers there. David Bowie, I think, was one. Uh, other refugees whose stories are related in my book made a major contribution to British culture too, out of gratitude to Britain. They funded the first, the beginnings of Glyndebourne and the first Edinburgh Festival as well. Seckers played a part in that. Or some became patrons of institutions. There's the Janogli family, for example, who made suppliers of knitwear, uh, who, who were suppliers of knitwear to Marks and Spencer, and they used some of their profits to um, uh, contribute to the city of Nottingham, where they had settled, funding a library and several university buildings. Now, moving away from the trading estates, um, I shall come to some individual stories, which I hope will illustrate the wide variety of ways in which the refugees managed to come to Britain and um, also how they enriched the textile trade and also some of the challenges and successes they encountered along the way. Now I've chosen the next subject. Uh, she was called Ilo Sommerfeld. It was almost inevitable that some kinder, people who came on the kinder transports, that they should make their way into the fashion trade too. And the reason I've chosen this story is because I found a story in the library here in this building, in the Wiener Library. Ilo uh, was the designer in charge of swimsuit design at Marks and Spencer. She was a German refugee. She was born in 1926 and died in 2008. Her real name was Inga Lore. Ilo was a contraction of that. Her truly moving story unfolds in the archive of the Wiener Library. Through a series of letters, photographs, and certificates, you can just about plot her trajectory. It's not a huge archive. So we've got this picture here, and then there's also this photograph of her grandparents' shop, apparently, in Berlin. Now, I don't think Illa was from Berlin. I think she was from Vienna, um, but we will... Uh, the, the, the shop, but her, her grandparents definitely lived in Berlin. Then we go back to the picture I just showed you. There's Ilo and her mother in the mountains. That looks more like Austria to me. We know from the Wiener archive description that she was a kinder transportee, one of the some 10,000 children who were sent to safety in England, mostly without their families. 
she was only 12. Although it's not known whether her family survived the Holocaust, there's one letter apparently from her mother, which Illo kept, which must have meant more to her than anything else she owned. It's dated the 27th of December, 1942. Quote, my dear, it's my translation of it. My dear Püppchen, little doll. I think we've got the German text here. I don't know if you can read it, it's rather small. Sometimes I wonder if we will ever see each other again. Today, once again, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for all the joy you brought me from the first day of your life. In good conscience, I can say that you brought meaning and happiness to our lives. My darling, I couldn't spare you from losing your father so young, but that I had to send you away aged only 12 without your mother stands as a mark of dreadful guilt on the book of my life. And it makes it even harder to say goodbye. I too lost my mother when I was only little. And so I know only too well, here, unquote, here the letter ends in a torn fragment. We can only imagine the mental state of a woman who was to make the choice, send her child alone into an uncertain future in a foreign country, or let her stay at home to risk an almost certain death. Yet Illo thrived. Only four years after her arrival in 1943, we can read her Northwood College School report featuring only A's and B's. Quote, she has applied herself with great keenness and has worked indefatigably. She deserves success in her examination, unquote. Not bad for a little German girl. Perhaps the Jewish community gave her comfort and support. Certainly her confirmation certificate from the West London Synagogue of the 9th of January, 1943 would point to this link. The next papers in her file are her certificates for typing and shorthand English and German from a school, a good way into various careers for girls in those days. Here's a letter from 1948, an offer of a post at the BBC. Then there follows a gap in the timeline. Dated 19th of August, 1955, a letter important enough to be saved tells her that her engagement as an assistant designer at Marks and Spencer is confirmed from the 1st of September. From a cheerful photograph in an article in the design department uh, in the House Journals, Michael's Magazine, autumn 1967, we see Illo, now a plump lady in her early 40s. She's the one in the middle there. Making the final adjustment to a two-piece swimsuit in a new trial fabric. She also kept a cutting from the MS Sparks magazine showing one of her swimsuits modeled by an MS sales assistant, a keen swimmer. We glimpse her again in later life, smiling into the camera with her dachshund. She never married, apparently, and she died aged 82 in Tunbridge Wells. Was she happy? Did she ever get over the loss of her family and the train journey and so on? Now, by strange coincidence, just a couple of weeks ago, I was on the phone to the m and archive in Leeds, where I'm going to give a talk next year. And this must have come up in the conversation because the Marks and Spencer archivist told me that not long ago she'd received an email about Illo uh, from a lady in New Zealand whose mother had been friends with Illo's mother and who seemed to think she was from Vienna, not Berlin. Um, and this is the quote from the friend. In the 1970s, Norma, the friend, brought Illo on a trip to New Zealand, where they spent much time with my family. This darkly exotic woman was obviously rich and seemed to have much that she could enjoy in life. But all I remember was the pain that seemed to exude from her and the haunting, unrelenting sense of unhappiness, unquote. Now, she wasn't rich, I don't think she could have been, but perhaps she was well-dressed, stylish, perhaps she clung to her appearance. And there's a lot more, I won't read it now, but it's about how Illo obviously was plagued by terrible, terrible back pain, and whether that was a manifestation of her suffering, which she had perhaps suppressed in some way. There's a lot of speculation about this. 
kinder transports have been very much studied in recent, um, in the last few years. Uh, we have a book launch here on the 6th of December. My colleague, Professor Andrea Hummel, has a new book out on the kinder transport. There's a much more nuanced approach to it now. In the past, I think it was seen as an, uh, an absolute success story. But now I think people are starting to look at the darker side as well, at the impact on the children, some of whom never actually got over the loss despite having their lives saved. But anyway, I urge you to uh, come to the launch uh, and look out for this new book. And I think I'll skip over the, um, the details about, about you know. I was just going to add the last point that there is some comfort in knowing that at Marks and Spencer, that company uh, was particularly kind to Jewish refugees. They were a Jewish company themselves. They employed very many. Uh, they made a point of employing them and they would have looked after her the best they could. Now, the next story is uh, one called Double Two. You have to picture this scene in Yorkshire, Wakefield, 1939. A train is pulling, a steam train, of course, is pulling into the station. It carries on it the family of one Isaac Donner, originally from Poland, but who had fled to Vienna to avoid the pogroms of that time. So very much like the Kangol story, double refugees, only having to flee the Nazis in 1938. On the Wakefield platform, three figures emerged from the steam. They were the manager of the uh, Midland Bank, the manager of the Labour Exchange, and a so-called business angel to help the Donners set up their shirt business. A translator soon joined the team. This was a good welcome because the Donners were bringing employment to a depressed area. Isaac carried his big idea in his head where it was safe from the Nazis, a shirt with extra collars and cuffs, which were easy to join on to older shirts when necessary. Of course, that was what happened in those days, didn't it? The collars and cuffs would get very dirty and worn out and people didn't have a lot of garments. But no sooner had the Donners set up shop when war broke out. Isaac saw that local girls working in dirty munitions factories and others needed clothes that could be washed and dried quickly in those days when people didn't have washing machines or tumble dryers. He started to produce cheap tops out of synthetic fabrics, which could be washed and dried overnight. They were very successful. Now they could afford to put their double collar scheme into production. By the end of the war, it too was selling well. In 1951, Donna and a textile trade friend, a Mr. Winfield, came up by accident with a new fabric. In fact, it was the first spun polyester proudly displayed in the factory to this day in Wakefield. It's the very first polyester shirt. To cut a long story short, by the 1980s, the Donna groups were employing some 1,500 people and selling over 3 million shirts a year in 40 countries. The baton was handed from grandfather Isaac to son Richard and grandson John. Just one of the many tributes to them came in the form of a Queen's Award for International Trade in 2013. Not all the people in my book were well known or part of big names companies. Here is the example next of somebody called Walter Berdach. He was born in 1904 in Vienna and wounded in the First World War. He and his wife had a son, Freddy, born in 1930, who I interviewed. In 1938, the Berdachs, as a Jewish family, had to flee and managed to get to Switzerland. As Walter sat in the synagogue in Zurich, he heard an appeal for someone to catalogue books in England and jumped at the chance. He managed to get to England and got a domestic visa for his wife. All they could bring out with them was a sewing machine and a radio. And unfortunately, many of their, uh, their goods were stolen en route. This is also a, a shameful story. They were robbed on the way here. Walter arrived in August 1939 and joined the Pioneer Corps. Now, this was the only part of the British military that refugees were allowed to join until quite late on in the war. The British government, deep down, just still didn't really trust them, trust their loyalty. Uh, the Pioneer Corps was a non-combatant corps uh, dealing with quite physical work, like dealing, moving equipment and ditch digging. 
And many of the refugees were not really suited to this work, but it was a way out of internment and it was the only thing they could do to help fight the Nazis. Walter was wounded in France and the family was separated for three years. By 1946, with the war over, they were living in Hampstead and needed to make a living. Now, Berdach had a thought. Why didn't British men wear bow ties like Mr. Churchill did, or like his fellow Germans and Austrians? He, Walter Berdach, would put this right and make them. Mrs. Berdach was a skilled seamstress and she had her sewing machine, but of course there was clothes and fabric rationing still. But one day, Mr. Berdach noticed some sacks of discarded blackout material, no longer needed now the war was over, and he bought them for a few bob. Mrs. Berdach got to work, made up the bow ties, and they put them in little boxes. Here's one I prepared earlier. Mr. Berdach set off to sell them at the poshest possible shops. He went straight to the Burlington Arcade in London's West End. Luckily then, there were lots of coming home parties for returning officers and soldiers, and evening dress was in demand. All flew off the shelves. Soon, Walter got uh, coupons for the ties, proper black satin, and they expanded the business now called Wabina, Walter Berdach, plus an N-A. Walter was soon selling the bow ties and other neckwear all over Britain. Uh, his son, Freddie joined the firm and took it to another level, exporting all over the world. Just mention uh, something of the Jewish nature of this experience in the Berdach case. You'll remember his mother came on a domestic visa and his father was away in the Pioneer Corps. The Freddie was fostered through the Jewish Board of Guardians. Well-meaning, but perhaps somewhat misguided, said Freddie, they decided to move him every three months as he was being fostered by Christian families and they didn't want his Jewish faith to be contaminated. As a result, he missed three years of school. Nevertheless, his own faith was only strengthened by this experience and he is still a very active member of his community. He had uh, Jewish religious instruction when he joined the RAF after the war. When I went off to interview him, he arranged to meet me um, from the tube station. You'll recognize me, he said on the phone. I will be wearing a bow tie. And so he was. I'd like to end now with the last story that has more of its share of surprise elements than you'd expect. It's called Silhouette. Silhouette made underwear. They were founded in Cologne in 1887 by uh, a Mr. Blumenau, uh, who did the finance, and Mr. Lobenberg, who was the technical genius, both Jewish. Early on, Mr. Lobenberg, uh, inspired by a skiing holiday, designed a corset which used boning inspired by the shape of skis, which slimmed down the heavier woman and presumably invoked the idea of healthy alpine sport. By 1930, already worried by the rise of Nazism, Lobenberg set up a branch in Paris. By 1938, the Cologne Company had been Aryanized, but by then, they'd already decided to come to Britain and founded Corset Silhouette Limited, where they made rubber corsets, which were perforated to stop them peeling or cracking. Slimness was fashionable then, and corsets sold well. Now, uh, I have to read a very small bit. <laughs> Silhouette became responsible for the world's first and perhaps only radioactive corset. When in 1937, Hans was approached by his partner Otto from the Paris office and offered the manufacturing rights for a new and revolutionary garment, the radioactive corset Radiant. Here you can see the ad. This foundation garment was advertised with claims that it was made from fabric impregnated with radioactive elements, uranium, thorium, and radium, and was said to give a feeling of energy, fitness, and resistance to chills. Incredible to us now, it was an immediate success with several department stores making orders. Nothing is known of the long-term effects, if any, on its, wear on its wearers. Like electricity, I suppose, when it was first discovered, radioactivity was tried out to cure all sorts of ills, including plumpness. 
The company chugged along breaking even when the war broke out and Silhouette was ordered to make utility garments. But the blitz started and they prepared, prepared to move out of London. Before then though, another unlikely story happened when a stranger walked off the street into the company with an offer of a sort of logo. It was a gazelle on a lead, very sort of art deco. And he said he didn't want any payment for it. If they decided to choose it, that would be enough in itself. And they loved it and they used it for their letterhead and their packaging and everything. And he just disappeared into the night. Nobody knew who, knew who he was or anything. A story of highs and lows, now came a less glamorous moment when the company and the families moved to Shrewsbury, where they'd found a number of disused buildings. It was a church hall, a waterworks, and a former pub. So the pieces, once cut out to make the undergarments, were wheeled in an old pram across the River Severn to be machined, a very far cry indeed from their smart factory back in Cologne. Both the current uh, Mr. Um, Blumenau and Mr. Lobenberg were nearly interned until the authorities realized that they were now major employers and were needed. After the war, they managed to start up business as usual, not realizing that their biggest success was still to come. Hans Lobenberg's second wife, the Czech-born Anna Marie, was a proper designer. Having been shown some new lightweight material, she designed a girdle with crossover panels which would flatten a heavier stomach and little X was born. You can see the logo on the right-hand side here of this ad. It really was hugely successful. In 1957, the firm's annual turnover was 1.3 million pounds from little X. Goodness knows what that is nowadays. But in the 1960s, a girdle and corset wearing went out of fashion Silhouette changed over to swimwear, as you can see here, and eventually faded away. The company became part of Shrewsbury's history too. And in 2009, Silhouette the Musical was staged there. I have a copy of the DVD. In the book, there are some 26 stories of individuals who came to Britain and whose lives were saved. In return, they brought us employment, they joined the war effort, they brought us new technology and design, color and style, as you can see here, uh, top left-hand corner, Bernard Klein, and the other two fabrics designed by Tibor Reich, all refugees. And you can safely say they more than repaid their debt to this country. Thank you. Thank you so much for that fascinating and colorful <laughs> lecture. Thank you, Anna. Um, so we have some time for questions. Um, and I would again remind everyone online, if you have a question, you can just post it in the chat. And if you just wait a minute, we'll come. We'll, um, Barbara will read them. Um, but first, does anyone have any questions in the room? And if you don't, we can go to the, <laughs> the questions online while you maybe think of some. Do you have do you have some online? Yeah. yeah, great. So I will let you. Yeah. So to people online, please feel free to post questions in the chat, and I'll see them. Um, so Nicholas says thanks. Really interesting. Um, and she asks if you know anything about the German Jewish sewing thread company uh, Gutemann. Um, and she gives quite a bit of information about that. So have you heard of them? Well, I have heard of them, but I haven't researched them. Um, I forgot to give a little um, plug. You may well know about this already, but at the uh, Museum of London Docklands, there is a fabulous exhibition called Fashion City, um, all about Jewish clothing uh, in London, the history of it right from the turn of the century. And it's far more comprehensive. It includes the first wave of immigrants, um, Jewish immigrants to Britain as well. And those people may well know about uh, Gutemann. I, that's not one, I, I know the name very well, the brand very well, but I haven't researched it. But you may find out more at the Museum of London Docklands. Okay, thank you. Yes, Nicola's saying um, that um, the, her family um, worked 
were involved with it and the business collect connection with Gutemann, which was trading before the war, helped help them um, emigrate. Um, so also a question from Raphael, um, who asks, are London designers such as Otto Lucas represented in the book? Well, that's very interesting. I'm wondering if Raphael has been to the Museum of London and seen the Otto Lucas display. I'm very proud to say that the curators used my book for their research. Great. Um, and acknowledged it very kindly. There's a book which goes with the, Lon the Museum of London as well, a lovely book, I recommend it. Um, he was very, very difficult to research. I was very pleased when I eventually managed to uh, interview his dying partner, Otto Lucas, was an absolute star. He had. A, he was a multi-millionaire. He just disappeared without trace. He had a shop on New Bond Street. He made hats for Greta Garbo, absolutely everybody. Um, uh, yeah, I've. There is a, one of the twenty-six stories is Otto Lucas, and it's it's wonderful. You have a look at the book, and then definitely go to the Museum of London and see the hats. I've used one of the hats as an illustration in my book, but um, yes, yeah, a great story. Okay, thank you. So um, Alan is asking if many of these businesses, business entrepreneurs, um, sought compensation from Germany after the war. Yes, they did. Uh, they're all very, very different. Um, quite a lot of people were entitled to restitution. It took a very long time to come, um, but some of them did. Um, I don't have figures or anything like that, uh, but definitely people who'd had an Aryanized factory, for example, that was a very obvious, um, you know, a, a way of researching what was owed and so on. For other people, it was more difficult. You had to prove. What you had, what you had owned, what you had lost, uh, but there, there was, there is a scheme of restitution which is, you know, patchy in its success, but it does exist. Okay, thank you. Any questions in the audience? Oh, right. Okay. If you speak into the mic. Thank you, Anna. That was a really interesting um, talk. You talked about some of the things that the refugees brought in terms of training, in terms of export orientation, in terms of skill, um, which, which influenced what was happening already. And you've ended with a slide which shows color, um, particularly colorful fabrics. I wonder if you could say something about the contrast that the immigrants, um, you know, what they made and what the contrast was with existing colors of fabrics and clothes? Well, this question comes from Celia Frank, whose father, Julius Frank, was a very successful um, German refugee, we can say, he was a, a, a fabric manufacturer and designer, made absolutely wonderful fabrics, some of them held in the V&A, and knows all about color and so on. Um, it, it, yes, I. I don't want to make a, a massive generalization, but perhaps, you know, using the examples on screen, that quite a few of the um, designer refugees did find that the palette in Britain was very sober. We think of tweeds and so on, that's what we were good at. Um, but they tried to, um, to introduce, to inject into the optimistic land that was now post-war Britain, a lot of color and, um, we had an online uh, with Insiders Outsiders Festival last night, a talk from the two curators from the uh, Museum of London and talking about Harris Tweed and what the refugees did with it. Now, Tibor Reich, uh, he um, wove it with lurex, you know, this silvery bright thread. So they had this wonderful, they weren't inhibited, if you like, by the tradition. They just looked at all, all the fabrics uh, in their own right and they could do different things with them. But I think if, if I were to dare to make a, a generalization, I would say that we that they did bring a big injection of color and interesting and different design uh, to the British palette. Would you agree with that, Celia? Do you think so? Um, I, I don't know enough um, of the existing uh, palette to say, but certainly my father's designs both for dress fabrics and for um, furnishing and, and uh, wall coverings were extremely colorful and humorous as well. Anyway, thank you very much. 
Yeah. You implied that because of the unemployment in the north of England, etc., that the British government was very open then to having immigrants and refugees coming into Britain. In or that's what I'm trying to understand. Was British policy open because they were going to provide sources of employment? And what was the general response to from the society as well, uh, well that to the refugees? That's a very good question. Unfortunately, it's a huge question. Uh, Britain still had the Aliens Acts from 1919, I think, um, saying that um, you had to prove that you had a, a source of income and support, that you wouldn't become a burden on the British state. So all the refugees had to have a guarantor, 50, put up 50 pounds to support them, unless they could prove that they had other means it, it, I, yes, obviously, I haven't got into all the different, you know, the different stories, but it wasn't that easy. If you came and you had a viable company with you and you would form, you know, you would create employment, then it, it was easier. If you were a small person, didn't have any obvious skills, it wasn't that easy. So it's a very, very nuanced picture. And a lot of people think that Britain could have taken in a lot more people. I mean, the kinder transport is the tragic story. Why didn't they bring the families as well? 10,000 children without parents, think about it. You know, there was a tragedy that could have been averted. On the other hand, their lives were saved. Um, um, you can contrast this with America, where they had a quota for each country. So, so many German immigrants, so many Italian, and they didn't increase the quotas in the 30s when there was desperate need. They didn't. You know, they may have numerically taken more people in overall, but they didn't respond to the crisis either. Um, whereas, you know, we took in the kinder. And so, so it's a very, very nuanced picture. You know, it's not all black or all white, really. Sorry, not a very satisfactory answer. We've got one more online. Um, so Alison's asking whether you have researched the Passolds brothers. Yeah. Yes. The well, Passold are very interesting. They were not Jewish refugees. They were Czech, um, but they were not Jewish. Um, so they don't really fall into the remit of the research. I did read everything about them because they were anti-Nazi, well, because of the things happening in Czechoslovakia and so on. And um, you may know, if you're old enough, the brand Ladybird clothing. It used to be sold at Woolworths. They made Ladybird. And they have a, a, a lovely family um, company history called Ladybird, Ladybird which tells you exactly, it's very, very informative because it tells you, you know, how you would come to Britain, how you would set up a factory, uh, what happened in the war, uh, but in great detail. So it's a huge, hugely uh, interesting and useful resource, but it's not a typical refugee story because they weren't, they weren't Jewish refugees. And they came well before the war, so they weren't even refugees, Czech refugees at the time. Okay, thank you. I think that's that's all the questions um, online. Are we selling the book today? I do have two copies left of the book, which are twenty pounds, which I think is cheaper than on Amazon. I've only got two paperbacks left, but if anybody would like one, of course, that would be great. <laughs> Well, it just leaves it to me to thank you, Anna, for this fascinating talk and to thank everyone for joining us both online and in person. Um, and thank you again for your work.